knowing that if I run a business, well, guess what? Money is the fuel that runs the engine. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that helps you do your best work more often. And not just your best work, but how you operate your business flows over to every other area of life. Your family life, if you have a family, friends, time outside of work, your passions, your projects, everything goes into how to have a good business and how that business impacts the other area of your life cannot be understated. Now, if you run an architectural practice today and you haven't already gotten access to our 60-minute firm owner training, what are you waiting for? Head on over to smartpracticemethod.com and you'll be able to sit through a training. You'll get learning education units for this and you'll get 10 years of expertise and, and experience working with small firm owners distilled down into 60 minutes of how you can run your best practice. Now, today I'm joined by Ryan Willard. Ryan, hello. Hi, Danny, Nick. Doing well. So today we're going to address this topic of architecture lies. This is going to be a multi-part series. We don't know how many parts there will be to this series, but this is going to be part number one. And we're going to be addressing, as I mentioned, architectural lies. We'll explain what this means. But ultimately, we know that the outcome of a lie is a falsity. And in business and life and anything that we're going for, when we're not standing on a foundation of reality or facts, as we like to say, then ultimately what we will produce is fiction. So when we're standing on the foundation of falsity, then we produce fiction in our life. This this has all sorts of problems in the architecture industry of having mid-career professionals jump out, leave the industry, uh, low pay across the board, competition between firms where they're focused on price and undercutting each other, uh, very, very high requirements placed on architects while other stakeholders aren't as liable where the architects are carrying the bag. So there's so many problems and issues relating to these lies we're going to be addressing. And Ryan has prepared, uh, he's going to read a little a little, uh, little manifesto that he wrote uh, about this particular architecture lie. And this is something that we hear often. And now when we say lies, please, please, we don't mean to, we, we don't mean to uh, incur any shame or guilt. Or perhaps just a little bit, perhaps just a little bit. But what we mean are these are these are falsities. And uh, with that, let's just jump right into it, Ryan. This is this is a statement that we hear architects say, and the statement itself isn't the lie. But there's a there's a liar of falsity or a fiction underneath this that we're going to be talking about and looking at today because it's very important. And the the myth or the um, the way that us as architects have embraced. This urban legend has has had and is having disastrous consequences for architectural practice. Yeah, I, I think it's important. To, I mean, we're using the word lies, and I know that's a very strong word, and might upset people to call this a lie. Um, but we've got to be. But these we're lies, glad to do it. We want to upset as many people as possible. And these lies, these lies are clever. Right, that's why we're calling it a lie because it's clever. Because on the surface of it, it comes across as something so noble. Okay, a lot of altruistic. Yeah, a lot of the architecture lies on the surface of them, and I get it. I understand what people mean. I understand what they're trying to trying to say. Right, but it ends up getting these statements, these lies, get abused, and they become the root of a lot of self deception. And a lot of letting ourselves off the hook and not having to be grown up and responsible about the fiscal matters that are happening in our businesses and the damage that they can do, the discomfort for team members, for for individuals, for people's practices, their financial health, their mental health, you know, all of the banners that we wave of, you know, um, all these fantastic causes, you know, from diversity to um, sustainability, all of these you know, they, as an as a broke architect or an architect to practice that's not financially, you know, kicking ass, there is no agency to be able to make these causes reality. Therefore, I would also, you know, suggest that if you're if people are saying these things about these causes and their businesses are not working, then there's a there's a there's something inauthentic about that. Mm, absolutely. There's some, there's yeah. something... Define when you say inauthentic. What do you what do you mean, Ryan? What do we mean when we say inauthentic? That it's it's a pretense that we're saying one thing and then behaving in another way that doesn't facilitate the thing that we say that we're standing for. Uh, exactly. That's it. That's it. Now it's, let's jump. What we'd like to do here is we'd like to identify. We're gonna we're gonna first address the problems 
that this this particular lie causes. So problem number one would be overwhelm. And overwhelm is generally, this is related to another lie, but overwhelm, let's talk about what overwhelm is. It's more specifically having too many things to do in the day as a practice owner. So one of the challenges of running an architectural practice is you have so many, there's so many hats that we have to wear. We have to invoice, we have to make sure the pipeline projects are coming in, not to mention just the architectural side of it of producing drawings. So what are the impacts of a firm owner being overwhelmed, having too many things to do? Well, it puts us into a state of heightened alertness. In other words, it puts us into a state, it puts our nervous system into a state of heightened stress. So this is the this is what we call the fight or flight stress symptom. Uh, and and the, there's the sympathetic nervous system, which is our, you know, basically it causes us to be in this heightened state of arousal where cortisol, which is a stress hormone, is circulating in our blood, causes us to be very alert, very wired, very ready to respond. It's a heightened state of stress. We're all used to this feeling. And I was just reading a study the other day uh, by a series of doctors who were saying that now more than ever, Americans, British citizens, I mean, people around the world, but it was talking about Americans are more stressed out than ever, just living a life of constant stress. And what ends up happening when you live in a state of constant stress is, number one, there's huge long-term health impacts of being constantly stressed because the body, in a fight-or-flight response, when the body's readied for action, this goes back to our biological underpinnings, it releases these hormones that energize us, that causes adrenaline to be released, it causes our muscles to be in a state of readiness, it causes the, bl- the, the blood actually to leave our brain and go into other areas of the body so we're more ready to run or respond rapidly. And this is exacerbated by running an architectural practice where oftentimes there's a lot of demands from uh, job site things that happen, emails that come in, phone calls, unexpected job site conditions, plus just the general worries of worrying about when the next project's going to happen. So the first impact would be this health impact, where our immune system is actually suppressed by the heightened cortisol and the heightened alertness of our body. So the body, what it does in a situation like that, it temporarily reduces energy to the immune system, which then makes us more likely to get sick, it makes us more likely to get worn down. It makes us, it, there's a whole slew of unwelcome health impacts that happen from being constantly stressed out. Now, if that was it, then that would be perhaps not that bad of a thing. However, we know that when we exist in a state of this fight or flight response, ultimately the impact that it has on our higher level thinking, our creative thinking, our creative functioning, it takes blood from that part of the brain. And again, to make our bodies more ready to respond, it means that our, our bodies and our brain state is in what we call like a, a high, a medium or high beta state, which you can do the research on it. When you're in a high beta state, it means you're constantly alert as to what's happening right now, ready to respond instead of perhaps an alpha state, which is a state of creativity, where you're more in a flow, where you can see patterns, you can see connections. And this is where the real breakthroughs happen, not only in design, but in business moves, in leadership, in your life, is just being calm enough to be able to see things from a higher perspective. And we can't do that when we're constantly in a state of stress and overwhelm. So that's problem number one. We could probably spend a whole episode talking about the negative impacts of having too many things to do as a business owner. Mm -hmm. So some other problems that occur from this lie, entertaining this lie in our minds, is low fees, right? So this is a complaint that we hear all the time, that you're just being underpriced, that you haven't, you're not commanding the fees that you want to be commanding. Um, very often, actually, an architect practice doesn't know what high fees would even be. So they just know that they're low. And there's a whole load of accompanying stresses that comes with low fees. It becomes very difficult to actually deliver the work the way that you want to deliver it. Um, there's a, a big drain on resource. The partners or the owners of the business end up getting sucked in to do an enormous amount of production work, therefore not being able to uh, build up their financial pipeline of new, of new projects and new work. So 
the practice gets stuck in this kind of up and down cash flow cycle, feast or famine, feast or famine. Um, it, on the worst case scenario with low fees, we know that people end up working there over, uh, end up working these enormous hours, and that can be not just for a few weeks. This can be over periods of years. It can be enormous, and then of course all the stress symptoms that you just mentioned there. That kind of is going to come hand in hand for sure. It becomes another problem. So we've got low fees, we've got stress and overwhelm. Another problem is actually being able to build out a team. So this lie that we tell ourselves means that it becomes incredibly different, difficult to retain talent, okay, unless they get brainwashed with the same lie, which often happens, right? But there's a, there's a, uh, people have a breaking point, and people who start to wake up and kind of realize that this is a lie that they've been fed and that they've bought, up, bought on, they will leave. So staff retention becomes very difficult, and we see it right across the the board recently. With you know, um, architecture practices, they struggle to um, pay a you know a high wage, a high living wage for uh, certainly mid tier architects. Oh, and guess what happens? Other corporate companies, so either large corporate architecture firms swipe swipe in and take that that talent, or Different industries or different kind of related industries, say product manufacturers, will take advantage of that kind of talent, and they can often afford to pay much higher fees. Okay, mm -hmm. or we have this, or we in general have this exodus of 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 talent. Very interesting. I was speaking to a recruitment agent the other day uh, over you know over the pond in the U.S., and he was telling me. This idea of the great exodus of all the talent disappeared, it's not so much that there's the talent that's disappeared, they've gone where they get paid best. And it's a much smaller number of practices that are able to pay people well. So there is a bit of kind of people leaving the profession, but there's also this kind of 80-20 rule of distribution where you know a lot of mid-tier talent that people are looking for is, well, they're going to where the money is. They're going to who can pay them the best. Energy, energy goes where resources flow. Energy go. goes where resources flow. So this lie sustains the inability to retain staff and to attract the type of caliber of people that you want in your business. Um, the lie also can impact the actual quality of the work that's being produced. So the actual output of the practice might be under par, or if it is the kind of caliber of work that the practice wants to be producing, it's at an enormous cost. It's at an enormous cost. All the things that we're just talking about, kind of mental health, hours, time, lifestyle, um, kind of work-life balance, relationships, all this kind of stuff. It becomes a very, very high price to pay for that kind of caliber of work that everyone wants to see get published. Okay. Or on the other flip side of it, the work just isn't up to par what people want it to be. Right. Absolutely. So that, that, that we get that horrible tension that people always, you know, so many practices are like, well, you know, if we did it, if we just focused on this one resource, then, you know, the work would be terrible. So this Absolutely, is yeah. So it, it it impacts the level and quality of architecture that's happening in the world, which is yep. quite a big impact as well. Absolutely. And so the other aspect of this, the other problem that it causes is the lack of agency, right? So again, we've spoken about this a number of times. You and I, Enoch, we're very committed to economic empowerment of human beings, Right, and it just happens that we're focusing on the architecture industry because that's guess what that's what we are that's where our experience is and that's what our expertise is and you know we are architects basically and economic empowerment is so important for making change it's so so important for making change and architects generally are very wise people in a way they're very altruistic. They have a broad awareness of society and civilization and how people interact and grow as communities, and it's something that's very important. And they've got the also architects are incredibly 
good at being able to think long term and see into the future and speculate and be optimistic. And I've often said here, um, it's rare that I meet a really pessimistic architect, even the most downtrodden Eeyore-esque type of architect. You just scrape on the surface a little bit and then shining bright light of optimism is actually still there, still intact. Right, so architects in general, we've got a kind of caring nature to the profession and an awareness of growth and wanting people to develop and evolve in communities and in cities and societies. And that means that we're often very passionate about certain causes. So diversity, inclusion, equity might be one. Sustainability is definitely another. Um, just general levels of housing. And being able to be somebody who's, um, you know, making change in the housing crises that might be uh, going across the, the Western world or, or other places or whatever other kind of noble cause there is. Okay, this all, our ability to have agency in actually taking action or executing an action or making change in those things is deeply impacted and reduced by believing this lie that we're about to talk about. Absolutely. So <laughs> let me tee this up with a quick story here. And this is, so as we, as we, now you're probably wondering, okay, what's the lie? Let's, let's have, let's have at it. We're, te we're teasing them. Uh, we're, we're, teasing teasing, them. we're teasing you. As you know, as we've talked about here on the podcast, uh, business of architecture, myself personally, I've, I've been looking at investing in an architectural practice. And so I've been in talks with a couple that have come and gone. And the current practice that I'm talking with, uh, it, it's not going too well in the in the talks because the, the firm is highly unprofitable. As a matter of fact, in the first five months of this year, they've taken a major loss and the firm owner stressed out, overwhelmed. And as I was looking at this, feeling quite quite compassionate for this architectural firm owner because it's, I empathize with the stress that this person's going under right now, feeling extremely stretched thin, and at the same time, not making any money to boot. And my mind went back to the first time that I met this firm owner, and I was introduced by a business broker. And so we met at a Panera Bread, and we're sitting down. And as we're sitting down across the table, I could tell this firm owner, first of all, was very, it was very interesting because he 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 didn't really know me. Um, wasn't a follower of the podcast. Obviously, if he's running a, a, a unprofitable architectural practice, but he was very he was very cagey, very cautious. I would probably say is the right word, and very very hesitant, very skeptical because I was a businessman, as as he put it. So he actually said a couple comments during our conversation that that where he said, "Well, I'm not a businessman," and he actually admitted to being a little intimidated because I was a businessman. And he's basically saying that I've never run my architectural practice like a business. And then he went on to give a lot of reasons why he's done that. And one phrase took, stood out, but he said, he made it very, very clear. He said, I've never been in it for the money. I've never been in it for the money. And this is something that I've, it's not the first time I've heard it. As a matter of fact, uh, this is something that I used to say when I started my architectural career and went to school to become an architect, right? I, I did want to, I did want to have means. I wanted to have resources. I wanted to be involved in a profession that, that compensated me adequately. But becoming rich and wealthy was never my, that was not my top cr criteria to picking architecture as a profession. I was willing to sacrifice some financial gain compared to my hedge fund manager buddies or my venture capitalist buddies or my doctor buddies or my other friends who are who picked high, high paying careers that are, that are known to be very high paying. So I, I compromised on that, but it was a knowing compromise because I valued the artistic pursuit and giving back to humanity as the way I saw it over, over finances. So I, I understand this is something I said myself. Now, this is, this is a phrase, if I had a dollar for every time I heard it, an architect say it to me, uh, you know, we could probably maybe not quite retire tomorrow, but at least take a first class trip down to Costa Rica and do some surfing uh, or maybe go to Pebble Beach and spend a day golfing. Uh, based upon the, the income from that, okay? So now this, is, this isn't the lie itself, but it does point at the lie behind it. So the statement is this, is, which is, I'm not in it for the money. And so when we say, I'm not in it for the money, in architecture, there's actually a hidden subtext. There's something else that we're saying here. It's, it's not, you can't take it at face value. What does it really mean 
when we say we're not in it for the money? What's behind that? Because on the face value, that's great. I'm not in it for the money. Well, great. What, what I find interesting is like most people that I know, even doctors, are not. I, I, I know very few people. I can't say I know anyone who's just in their career just for the money. Like I can't think of anyone. My attorney friends, my doctor friends, my my real estate investor friends. Well, maybe they're just in it for the money, but no, <laughs> no. Even uh, I, know, them, I, I know people in finance who are who are in it for the money. But. There you go, and yeah. they live miserable, horrible existences. Okay, so most most people that have careers, professionals that I know of in my personal circle, anecdotally, I mean, they're not they're not in it just for the money, but are they in it for the money? Absolutely. Right. So what's the what's the hidden what's the hidden context here? So is if we're not in it for the money, Ryan, what are we in it for? Are we in it for the poverty? I hope not. <laughs> I'm not in it for the money. Well, what are you in it for? I'm I'm in it for the to be broke. I'm in it for the I'm in it for the poverty. Well, obviously we have higher aspirational things that we're in it for. We're in it to design, to exercise our creative muscles, to be able to provide whatever service it is we're providing to people, housing spaces, addressing a lot of the issues that Ryan was talking about earlier. But what's what's the hidden subtext that we've seen that goes beyond, that, that underlies this statement, Ryan? So the, the, the subtext is saying that I don't care about money. And it's saying that, I, that money's not important for me. Mm. And, it's, and it's also... What, what it actually plays out as in a business is that, well, then you don't become responsible about money. You don't have to be responsible about money. You don't have to look at your accounts. You don't have to think about how profitable a project is because I'm not in it for the money. We're not in it to make, to make loads of profit and to make money. That's not why we do it. We're here in it for the design and for the, and for the, and for the, the noble contribution that we're making to society and civilization. So we're not in it for the money. Well, guess what? Bet your team members are. Yeah, at least partially. Right? right? They want to get paid. Absolutely. They're there working their asses off because they want to get paid. So, you know, I, we're, we'll hear employees and business owners say this as well. But the, the sinister thing about this statement is that it ends up as a, a kind of escape valve of responsibility. It means that if I identify as somebody who is not in their profession for the money, it means that, well, number one, I'm kind of elevated by saying that because I'm not a, I'm not a, a low-level, um, selfish, greedy business person. It's quite normal. I'm, it's, it's, On the I'm, altru- it. uh, it's, I'm altruistic and I'm here to serve humanity and to, and to give. Okay. Um, but then on the, on the, you know, the, the kind of sinister part of it is, is like what I'm saying, it's we don't have to be responsible for money. We don't have to look at it. And right? you, have a, you have a beautiful manifesto, Ryan. Would you be so kind as to read that for us? Yes, I'll read the little. So, I'm not in it for the money. This is a work in progress, by the way. This seems like a noble statement at first. However, it gets abused and becomes a statement that allows ourselves to get off the hook so we don't have to face being financially responsible. We don't have to own our financial circumstances. It's not my fault. I hear architects use this a lot. Sometimes I'll have the opportunity to look at somebody's finances, as what we do here at Business of Architecture. Sometimes we see and like what you're just um, the story you were just sharing you'll look at somebody's finances and often when the outlook isn't good we'll hear i'm not in it for the money okay so it becomes an excuse it becomes a reason and it becomes very easy for us to, to wave flags of virtue for causes that we care about but to have real agency means being financed is this easy no but it's not as impossible or as hard as the statement above makes it. Right. So what I'm saying there is that the statement itself, I'm not in it for the money, ends up being this huge handbrake on all the things that we're saying that are important to us. And it also, it also justifies 
the problems that we're experiencing. So it justifies the overwhelm. It justifies the the reactionary operation of an architectural practice. It justifies that because we can say, well, you know what, I'm dealing with all these things, but I'm not in for the money. So these these are like the necessary cross that I have to bear. These are the necessary sacrifices that I make to be able to do something that makes the world a better place without necessarily making the financial aspect uh, the prime the prime motivation, which mm-hmm. is just it's just a lie, right? So it's like saying it's like saying that my car. So, you know, my car has an engine, right? It's like saying, well, you know, the engine the engine isn't that important to the car. I'm not I'm not in it to have an engine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in it to have an engine. So here's my car. It's a beat up old Ford Pinto that's barely running along. It's burning gas uh and, and burning oil and uh you have to push start it down the hill. But um, you know, I to be honest, I'm I'm not really in it to have an engine. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. it doesn't have an engine. It just sits there on the side of my driveway collecting cobwebs and dust because I'm not in it to have an engine. Mm-hmm. I'm in it to go someplace, but you know, I'm not in it to have an engine. Yeah. So we somehow we separate this idea. So it's the same thing with money. Because we can't we can't separate money and the need for money from running of of a business. I mean, that's just what a business is. So certainly we, we, we don't need to be in it for the money, but what we're really saying there is money's not important. Uh, I feel uncomfortable with my ability to manage it. I don't have enough of it as I would probably need to run the business that I need to be running here. And so as a result, I my mind goes back to comfort me in this difficult situation, which is quite difficult, by telling me that I have nobler aspirations and this is the price to pay to be able to do good work. Mm-hmm. And the underlying lie here is that uh, money is important. Not only is money important, but it's essential for an architectural practice, and having high aspirations are not are are, are not co- counter opposed to caring about money, right? So yeah. it's sort of like saying like caring about having an engine is is not counter opposed to getting someplace. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's really interesting because it's you know we get it we understand why people say I'm not in it in it for the money because you're trying to make a distinction of I'm not selfish and greedy and we're doing this just for cash. Yeah, get it. Nobody is. Yeah. Right. But also that statement has this kind of power to it, which means that it it allows us to negate money in the business and be irresponsible. That's what happens. And, you know, we, we keep on hearing it and seeing it. And, you know, I'm, I always remember the when I first started studying architecture at the Bartlett, probably one of the first days there, the whole year group was kind of brought together there's maybe 120 people and the head of the first year there said uh okay so there's 120 of you now there's probably only going to be 30 percent of you that actually make all the way through to becoming an architect in the space of the next decade or so right okay so it's kind of qualifying us already and setting up setting out a big challenge and she then went on to say that this is a profession where you will not be making a lot of money and it is very, very difficult. And that is not why you are here. If you want to be making a lot of money, then you need to be choosing a different career. So I think back on that now, I mean, as a student, I kind of just, I didn't even question that. It didn't even, I was just like, yeah, yeah, of course, I know that. A bit bit of self-righteousness is a bit of a rallying cry. Like, we like a challenge. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah, it was like, yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. I know I'm here for a deeper, meaningful purpose that doesn't got anything to do with money. Filthy lucre. I know I'm here for, like, something creative. And then it gave me me a kind of um, moral high ground to look at anybody else in a different profession that was earning a lot of money and to be like, oh, you cretin. Yes. You self-indulgent, selfish, greedy person. No yes. idea about the, the, the kind of riches that comes with following a noble pursuit that giving, that's given back to humanity. So there's this kind of attitude, right, that was, you know, in, in, you know and it was, it was kind of like, it, at the time it was, there was a, a sense of inspiration around that statement. But that's, you know, in, in any other context, when people are doing that kind of thing, that's, that's brainwashing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
right? Yeah. Because because that kind of idea, the, the again the 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 lie of this, I'm not in it for the money. We end up abusing this statement. It gets us off the hook, and the damage that ensues as a result, you know underperforming businesses, low fees, people working crazy long hours, not being able to pay staff, um, you know, the what it does to people's health, how it takes them away from their families, working 80-hour weeks. Right, okay. We've been programmed. We've picked up something, and unintentionally, it's, it's like a, a kind of viral, a virus type of program that's corrupted all the other sense that we've had. Right, and architectural education—we've said this many a time—is completely a void. Was completely void of anything business-related. It's just seven years of just kind of indulgent intellectual musings. Right. Well, maybe where I went to school, I don't know. I can't. That's not. That's <laughs> Cornell, not. That's that was the, the case as well. Yeah, there's, 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 <laughs> I know that there indulgent. is. A, there's a, there's a lot of other other schools I will say that are out there at the moment which are doing great things and are kind of making a much more healthy bridge towards the profession and citing the context of economics, you know, within architectural education. But it's 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 they're few and far between, and they're the exception rather than the rather than the the kind of the general generality. Okay. Well, you know what's really interesting here is that that we as architects, and I know because I've done it myself, we somehow merge this conversation of the morality of design and the making of money. So we somehow marry these things up where we think they're the same thing. We think they're related somehow when in reality, they're not. Doing architecture and doing design itself is a profession, is a craft. If I'm an architect running a practice and you come to work for me, then... I mean, I'm going to pay you a salary, yes, but at the end of the day, you're going to be focused on doing architecture. You're not going to have to worry about money, right? They're, they're completely separate. Now, if I'm a business owner, in addition to an architect, then I have a business to run. I have people to pay. I need to set adequate fees to be able to ensure a profit. So with the profit, we can then invest back in the business and the best systems and the best processes in things that bring us better projects like PR, like being able to have good marketing materials, being able to spend the free time building relationships and hiring people if I'm not a business developer myself, bringing someone else on who can build those kind of relationships. Crazy. Well, it is crazy when we look at it that way, but it's it's so interesting that we fall into this. And the lie here, again, the lie is not, I'm not in it for the money. That's a true statement. The lie beneath it is money isn't important. Yeah. This is the lie. The money isn't important. The statement is the kind of cover-up. Yes. It's the, distra it's the distraction. The it's distraction. The, it's the sleight of hand. There you go. Yeah. Right? It's the diversion tactic from the lies that kind of percolate underneath it but we can start to sniff it out with, with that statement. Absolutely. And, and when, when we think that money is not important, I mean, one of the challenges that I found is, again, as an architect, as a professional, so architects by and large, look, we consult with architectural practice owners. We're, we've trained as architects ourselves. Uh, it, it's not easy to become an architect. And generally, if you are an architect, you're, you're highly intelligent. You're a highly intelligent person. Uh, you're, you're likely a highly ethical person. Uh, so these are great and, and admirable qualities. One of the challenges that I see, especially like, well, I'll, I'll just pick on my doctor friends here for a minute, you know, is that we've gone through so much training and we are so smart, quote unquote, that oftentimes we think that everything should come easily to us or that we know everything there is to know about business, right? I remember I fell into this trap when I started my architectural practice, which is thinking that, I mean, I'm smart as an architect, so I could just figure this stuff out. You know, what is business anyways? It's simply a matter of businesses getting paid. I mean, that's all I thought it was. I thought you just charge the right prices and uh, get paid and maybe pay rent on an office building and you're good to go, right? Which is a very naive way to look at it. It's the way I looked at it before because like Ryan said, there's a gap in the education, but it doesn't talk about forecasting financials. It doesn't ca talk about pipeline management, making sure that we have enough work in the queue. It doesn't talk about actually managing the workflow of that 
of that work. It doesn't talk about best practices for how you charge, how frequently you charge, how much you charge, the way in which you collect, what happens if clients don't pay. It doesn't have anything to do with how you present your services, how you communicate the value of design, how you hire people, how you attract them to your practice, how you set up a culture, how you lead your people, how you keep them accountable. I mean, I could keep on going on and on, but you know, there's a reason why people go to MBA programs and spend three years in an MBA program. We've had MBA people with M- business degrees, MBAs come through uh, our program, Smart Practice, and oftentimes they're like, man, you know, nothing I learned in my MBA really prepared me for running an architectural practice because it's different. You know, A lot of times MBAs will be going over global concepts that don't have a lot of applicability <laughs> like logistics, supply chain management, innovations in digital processing, you know, all sorts of interesting and very pertinent macroeconomic trends, you know, things like that that are all very important, but for running a small practice, they're not important at all. You know, they're not really relevant. So, you know, one thing about smart practice, the program we run is we have architects that come in and they're just blown away. They're like, wow, this is next level. Like this is next level business education that I could not get anywhere. And it is highly, highly honed and highly tailored to running a successful small architectural practice. But it starts with the conversation of you got to make money is important. You got to realize that money is important. And when money becomes important, we're not saying that you need to be greedy. There's a difference there. There's a difference between being greedy and just wanting for personal gain and making money important. Right? Knowing that if I run a business, well, guess what? Money is the engine of the car, or better said, it's the fuel that runs the engine. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we're not we're not suggesting that you become like a soulless person who's just in the relentless pursuit of of money to fulfill a kind of you know a lack of empathy and compassion in your soul. Right? That's not that that's not the that's not the polarized thing that you know being interested in money is about. Absolutely, I mean you can you can be passionate about design. We can be passionate about design architecture, sustainability, building innovations and how human beings live, how they interact. And you can also be passionate about making money. Yeah. And they're two, if, there's two separate things. I mean, uh, I mean, I'll, my personal experience with, and I've worked with some amazing architecture practices, but actually the financial side, the deal-making side, the salesmanship side is actually more creative than a lot of architecture. Mm, that is that is a sad, but what do you call that? It's sort of a, a little talked about, little talked about a truth, a little talked about aspect of architecture. Uh, architecture, let's face it, it can be very repetitive. It can be very formulaic, mm-hmm. and yet the acquisition of a project, everything that goes into presenting the project, understanding the client's pains, doing the the makeup of the client, uh, understanding how the project fits in with the organizational goals of the client. All of these things are highly, highly intellectually stimulating. Pretty fun, as a matter of fact. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, selling variety. selling and conversation is, you know, the sales conversation is like, it's a beautiful improvisation, right? And the best, if you look at something like, I've heard architects in the past, you know, they will make They'll, they'll compare architecture to jazz music and some very lofty kind of philosophical musing. And you're like, well, mm, maybe. I don't really think so. Okay? But having a conversation with somebody, another human being, where you've practiced and rehearsed bits of the conversation to lead it down a certain direction, that's much more like a creative art, like music or jazz. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's, a very, it's a very creative thing. And I think that, you know, when we talk about I'm I'm not in it for the money, we end up missing out on the joy and the interest and the fascination around business and leading people and communicating, and all of that kind of just gets parked to the side. So we're not even, you know, we're not even ready to embrace or to enjoy it. It's just been, you know, that's the damage that this that this lie has. That it means that we we kind of close ourselves off to this wonderful world of of business and creativity and the art and science of of negotiating and making money and you know building pipelines and all this kind of stuff it's not a necessity it's like you say it's fun it's like it's amazing 
Indeed, and there's there's other lies here too that 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 go underneath this particular lie, which is okay. Money's not important. This is a lie. We know that's a lie. Um, another lie that would be attached to that is the way that we moralize the making of money. Mm-hmm. So we moralize the the actually flip it around. We moralize the not making of money. We moralize the lack of money. We moralize our neglect of our financials, which is very very interesting how we do mm-hmm. this, right? Yeah. It's the old starving artist kind of mentality, the romance, the romance of the impoverished artist who is walking a true and noble path to their artistic integrity and, and self-enlightenment by producing work that's unfettered and untainted by, you know, by financial gain. And it's like, hmm. And it's, it's certainly true that that work can be compromised by a focus only on the money. I mean, I think that as architects, this is one thing that we see, and this is part of this conversation of I'm not in it for the money, is we see what happens when the bottom line becomes the most important thing, Mm -hmm. right? We see people compromising their ethics. We see people compromising values. We see people doing things that are shady, underhanded, uh, simply for money, right? But this is not an either-or conversation. It doesn't need to be, well, you know, if you're going to make money, it's got to be underhanded. You've got to be focused on the bottom line. You have to be driving a hard bargain and everyone else loses in the deal. That's not what we're saying. That's the other extreme. This is not a pendulum. We're not saying you have to be on one extreme, which is money doesn't matter, or the other extreme, which is like money at all costs and everything else, toss it to the wind. No, what we're saying is there is a middle path. Mm-hmm. There is a middle path. And the middle path is high design value, high design importance, high craft, and high profitability. Absolutely, and 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 again with with you know when we're evaluating design as well, I think in modern architecture we have such a focus on a very kind of slim, like a slim section of what is great design, because we don't consider the finance behind it. We don't consider what the what people had to do with the money that was available, or how the project was actually realised, or what the kind of the financial engine was behind actually the project and the constraints that the client and the architects were working in. So we dismiss it. We dismiss it and it becomes less interesting. And actually that's very problematic because we end up viewing architecture in a very one dimensional way because we're kind of, we're ignoring the commercial forces that have been at play or if commercial forces have been at play and, it's not aesthetically to our tastes or, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a perceived lack of innovation around it, then it becomes, you know, slandered. And what, is it, what does the world look like when, when architectural practices are highly profitable? What can happen then? Team members are highly compensated. Yeah. Firms can take on less work because they're well-resourced. They have the ability to spend more time on those projects, more time in design, more time up front if they want to, to ensure better project outcomes. We get a, we get a much higher quality of, of product. I mean, you know, the, the kind of not, the, the not focusing on business or money and kind of denouncing it as something that's not important leaves the architect vulnerable to other industries and disciplines that are much more financially savvy, who are much better at negotiating, much better at marketing, and they win all the work. And then the overall built environment quality diminishes because there is no architects who are actually actively involved in in the conversations, or they've been totally they've been totally cut out of it. Um, and who gets the blame for poor quality built environment? Well, architects. Yeah, architects. architects we we architect, carry the bag. Architects we who get kicked who, under. We get kicked under the bus. Who aren't necessarily involved? On that, Ryan. So, just as an example of what Ryan's saying here, I have a I have an acquaintance of mine who runs a construction management company. So this is basically they do owner representation, which in a project here's what it looks like. They're looking out for the owner's best interests. So they're managing the contract. They're they're reviewing 
uh, payments to the contractors, their certifying payments, et cetera. They're, they're processing and looking at change orders. They're basically an in-between person between the architectural team and, and the contractor uh, representing the owner. So I have a friend. Uh, she, runs, she runs a company like this, and uh, it's highly profitable. She spends most of her time meeting with people, networking, doing business development. Uh, she has she works you know a couple days a week. Uh, she has a private plane that she likes to fly out to the coast, so she can she likes going up to uh, play golf. So she'll go play golf at Pebble Beach and stuff like this, you know. <laughs> and she has you know I'm just like I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, this is really incredible. Zero liability, you know, getting paid handsomely like. The fees that this firm got paid on the architect was equal, almost equal to the architectural contract to actually deliver the project in terms of the fees. Wow. Right. Yeah. And at the end of the day, all we have to do is blame ourselves. right? It goes back to the victim mentality. It goes back to that conversation that they gave you at the Bartlett School, which is very similar to the conversation. They must be reading off the same script because I remember day one, any of my colleagues at Cornell who were there on day one, they will, they will remember the conversation that our well-meaning professors had with us, which is, you know, look to your left, look to your right. Those people will probably not be there, right? <laughs> it's like, this is like very few of you, 30% of you, 20% of you are going to make it through. And they were right. We started out with about a class of 100. And I think they were, there were 20 graduating people at the end, all told, that graduated from the five-year program. Yeah. And, okay. and, and, they, and they made it out because it was, you know, those people left because they weren't talented enough rather than they, they, they cracked on and were like, sod this. This is... Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. not going to get paid very well. Yeah, they they became wealthy, wealthy investors. They became uh, poets property developers. and property developers. Exactly. You Who know. we all work for now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we have, you know, when 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 we tell ourselves the story, what it comes down to is we put ourselves in the victim category, which is like this is just the way the architecture industry is. So when we give up the story, when we as architects recognize. And recognize the truth. We're not talking about recognizing something that's false, but actually give money its due importance. Then what ends up happening? The the competition of firms competing with each other, trying to knock each other down on fees ends. Because firms now are standing in their own value. We value ourselves. At the end of the day, we're the ones to blame for the fact that we don't get compensated more highly. It's just us. It's just us. We only have ourselves to blame, which is a difficult thing to look at. But the beautiful thing about it is these skills to be able to capture high fees, there is a way to do it. There is a way to communicate the value of design. This is one of the key pillars of smart practice that the firm owners learn when they go through our program, which is like, you know, the fees that you charge are usually number eight, nine, or 10 on a buyer's criteria, like truly. However, what we think as architects is we usually think that the fees we charge are up like maybe the top three things that a client's considering. They're actually not. So if you get highly skilled at communicating the value of design and you understand how to sell, you understand how to sell your architectural services, you can become highly compensated. You can have a well-resourced firm. And this is a rising tide that's going to raise all boats. But it starts with us actually understanding that money is important. You know, my fear, Ryan, uh, for the industry is that there's so many architects out here, maybe even some who are listening, that just the idea of making money important to them actually turns them off. It curdles their stomach. It makes them think, ooh, that does not sound very fun. I don't want to do that. I'll just suffer and deal with all the things that I'm dealing with. I'll try to continue to, uh, you know, give the cheapest fees possible. Maybe not the cheapest fees possible, but I'll continue to try to give very competitive fees as opposed to charging premium fees, and I'll just deal with it. There's probably there's the fact is there's probably going to be quite a number of people in the industry that this is this is they're just not willing to budge, they're not willing to change. Mm -hmm. Which yep, and we'll probably get emails about this podcast. People saying, "How dare you? How dare you guys?" I remember once um, when I first started podcasting, a an architect, uh, uh, one I looked up to a lot and respected, wrote me a message and said, you really shouldn't be talking about money. You shouldn't mm. be talking about business. You this sold not, out. You, it was, yeah, you've sold out. It would be so much better to, for you to get back to designing beautiful buildings. Yes. Why are you talking about this? This is not what we do. There you go. And I was like, you know. Wow. Dagger in my heart. Oh. And, also, and 
And also like, wait a minute. Why am I, why am I now feeling bad about talking about money mm -hmm. and business? Why do I feel bad about expressing to other people of, you know, I'm interested in the money side of stuff. I want to see how to make m more of it. Well, you know I what Jesus said about that, Ryan? No. Okay. So Jesus said, <laughs> Jesus talked about money and architecture. As a matter of fact, little little do people know. <laughs> where is that in the Bible. Where is that in the Bible? Let me know. Yeah. yeah okay. I want to paraphrase here. He says, um, "Have joy when people persecute you and speak evil of you falsely, because they persecuted the prophets that came before you." <laughs> So when people have an unsavory message, there you go, Ryan, you'd have just entered the ranks of the martyrs of history with a message that is here to help humanity and you are being torn down. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that story and that's, it's tough. You know, one of the things about us putting ourselves out here on a podcast, on social media, is that we put our views up for discussion. We put our, ourselves out there to be criticized. We put ourselves out there to be argued with and contended with. I remember, you know, when I first started the Business of Architecture podcast, for the first, I don't know, maybe the first year or two, I was very, wanted to look very professional. And so in the interviews, I would wear a white shirt and like this black tie that I, that I had. And it was just for you probably. Do you remember seeing those? I episodes? remember those. I remember, remember those. those. Yeah. It was in your kitchen with the curtain. Yeah, I had my little curtain behind me and I was all, you know, yeah. I'm like, well, at least if I have a $25 curtain behind me, at least I'll have a white shirt and a tie because I want to look, I want some people to think I'm professional. Classic, some classic episodes there. They are, and they were yeah. they were good content. Yeah, they were great. Right. They were so great. check this out. So there was there was an architect from uh, from New Zealand, as a matter of fact, who wrote me a scathing message and he criticized me. And what, here's what he criticized though. He criticized the way I dress because he says you look like an accountant. And for him... That was the most like demeaning comment he could give me is that I look like an accountant. <laughs> oh, uh, bless. I know, I know. That's funny. So, so you know, not only you know, not only do we say money's not important, but we actually use the professions that are involved in money as slurs to cut down our colleagues or other people who are, who are straying from the, uh, the, the, the standard narrative uh, that like, we've all um, embraced. You know, Bjarke Engels has spoken about this. He's, he has said in the past that when architects say, you know, when architects say of another architect, oh, they're good at marketing, there's a whole load of unsaid narrative that goes there, which basically is implying you're good at marketing, but you're not good at architecture. Ah, uh, well done, which right. is another whole thing that we find as architects, and we're interested on, on your, on those of you listening, so you who's listening to this episode, this is something that we've, we've seen, I'm curious about this, but that brings up a good point, which is our reluctance to market. So as a matter of fact, architects actually have a great reluctance to market because there is a hidden narrative that, um, that if you're marketing, that must mean that your work is inferior or substandard so perhaps that'll be another one of the lies that we can address in a future future episode ryan oh gosh yeah i'm glad you brought that up Brilliant. so our call here is simply this money is important and making money important does not diminish all of the wonderful attributes and wonderful things that we stand for as architects sustainability good communities good buildings uh better you know better societies a more responsible stewardship of the environment and our built environments, right? Safe places for kids, for families, for communities, for people, for individuals. And this has is only going to be possible and it's going to be accelerated by making sure that we give money its due, that we realize that money is important. It has nothing to do with architecture per se. It has nothing to do with morality. It has to do with running a profitable business. And it's very possible to run a highly profitable business that's ethical, that does great design, that makes a lot of money, that compensates team members exceptionally well, that provides experiences, training, and personal development for team members, and that makes the owner as well exceptionally wealthy. When we look at what architectural firm owners make, it's a huge spectrum. So we see firm owners, we talk to firm owners who are making $70,000, $100,000, 70,000 pounds, um, less. which would, yes, which would be less, right? Less, less 30,000, 40,000 pounds. And, yeah. uh, 
and, and they could be earning more working at a Chick-fil-A restaurant or uh, a Burger King restaurant at a management level or a mid-management level, right? Without a degree, without liability. And, and, and so we look at this and we think, wow, there's a huge gap here that can be filled from where we're at, right, in the architecture industry to having architects who are exceptionally well paid. Ultimately, it starts with us and ultimately it starts with caring about money. Now, the good news for you listening to this podcast is that there will be a lot of your colleagues, they will never change. They will never change their mindset. They will never wise up to the fact that money is important, which makes an opportunity for wise architects like you who care about design and also recognize that money is essential. So you can make a lot of money. When we look at what architects make, yep, some are making low end of that spectrum. And then we have we have firm owners and we know we have colleagues, friends who are making, bringing home $800,000 a year, a million dollars a year. It's not uncommon to do that with a practice that's producing exceptional work, having great team members, having freedom, and having a good life and a good business. So that's the picture we want to paint for you today, is if you've fallen into this narrative of money's not important, you're not the only one. We have a disadvantage in the business world as architects because no one ever taught us these things. And so it can feel a little overwhelming and discouraging when it feels like the money's so hard to keep it flowing and manage it in the practice. We get what that feels like. This is why... Ryan and I are here in the architecture industry. This is why we haven't yet said, hey, we're out of here. We're going to go help lawyers or we're going to go help business owners in other niches or other industries because we know there's a need here and we know that someone like you who's listening here has the ability to impact. The only way we can change the industry is for those of you who are listening to this now to rise up, to continue to hone your skills. And what a better place to do it than Business of Architecture Smart Practice Program where we're literally creating a movement of architects who are savvy when it comes to finances. And for more about that, you can go check out smartpracticemethod.com. Ryan, I look forward I, to the future episodes we're going to talk about some. We have I, other, other, other lies of the architecture industry that we will be discussing for sure. Absolutely. And we'd love to hear from you you who are listening, we'd love to hear the lies that, that you see, that you've either discovered in yourself, because we all have them, we all go through these growth stages in our self-awareness, but also any lies that you see in the industry um, that other people have, right? Send that over to us. Email support at businessofarchitecture.com. Uh, perhaps the lie that you mention will be the focus of one of our next episodes. Amazing. Thank you, Enoch. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.